Hi, everyone. My name is Zach Whitus. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of the call today. Uh, I'm the Young Leadership and Education Coordinator here at the New Israel Fund. Um, today's event is co-sponsored uh, by the New Israel Fund, uh, Rise Up Initiative, and the Jewish Liberation Fund. Um, for myself, I've worn a, a variety of hats in movements for justice in the United States, as well as Israel-Palestine. Uh, from on the ground solidarity activist to local anti-occupation organizer in Detroit and Chicago to tenants rights struggles um, and also in Chicago and now um, uh, serving as the new gen coordinator here at the New Israel Fund where I oversee our various fellowships and our, our domestic work um, trying to build bridges between movements on the, here in the United States and on the ground in Israel Palestine. I um, just want to take a minute uh, to introduce the series as a whole. This is the third installment of our What We Need to Win series, Economic Empowerment for Progressive Jewish Movements um, in the US and Israel-Palestine. Um, throughout this series, we've been bringing you the voices of frontline activists and change makers in a variety of areas. Intercommunal organizers based in New York and Haifa, artists and creators from New Mexico to Tel Aviv, and now today, Jews of color, Sfardim, Mizrahim, who are taking the reins and propelling our Jewish communities forward from California, to Israel's geographic and social periphery and everywhere in between. Uh, like I said, we're throughout this series, we've been about you know, building bridges uh, between, you know, between activists here in the States who are doing the critical change making work and fostering critical connections between them and their counterparts uh, across the ocean in Israel, Palestine, leveraging the broad network of organizations that the Jewish Liberation Fund, Rise Up Initiative and, and the New Israel Fund can bring together um, so that we can we can underscore the importance of progressive funding and fueling our movements in all countries that our people call home. Um, I want to offer just a, a bit of a personal connection for me to the topic of our webinar today, uh, making philanthropy work for Jews of color, Sephardim and Mizrahim. Um, for myself, I entered the, the world of Jewish communal politics, specifically through the struggle uh, against the Israeli, Israeli military occupation. Um, I had been laser focused on this issue since, since college, um, but when I actually traveled to the land, to Israel-Palestine for the first time in 2018, I started meeting other anti-occupation activists and civil society leaders, and I caught a glimpse of the larger fabric of intersecting social and political issues in Israel-Palestine today. So while, while I was there confronting the brutalities of the occupation and meeting with Palestinian and Israeli lay leaders in that fight, for justice and equality. I was also forced to confront my own white Ashkenazi biases. And I started to ask myself um, in, in, within a community of like-minded you know, activists on the left about how I could be in the land, how I could be in Israel-Palestine working for social justice, but not, not dedicate myself also to fighting the systemic oppression of Mizrahi Jews, of Ethiopian Jews, of Jews from Arab lands, Persian lands and beyond. Indeed, as, as one of our panelists uh, reminds his readers and interlocutors often, one can't dismantle the regime of military occupation without also dismantling Ashkenazi supremacy. The two are intimately interlinked. So now at the, in my new role at the New Israel Fund, I'm proud to be working with colleagues in order to critically reflect on the history of underfunding and undersupporting organizations by and for Jews of color, Sephardim and Mizrahim, but more than that, I'm proud to be working to change that reality and strengthen our solidarity with those organizations and help resource them in ways that they need to win. So all that's to say, I'm very excited for this conversation today, where we're bringing together all these amazing leaders from both sides of the ocean for a much needed conversation about how we can better resource uh, their organizations and organizations in similar footing so that we can all do better. Um, just a quick note about q and I want to invite people to use the, the Q&A function um, in the, uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you click the More tab, you'll see Q&A there. That's where we're going to be gathering questions during this discussion. Um, if you want your question asked uh, towards the end, that's the, that's the place to put it. And um, Jordan Mann, my, my co-organizers from JLF, will be collecting those and giving those to our moderator uh, to present later on. Um, I also want to say that uh, at the conclusion of our main discussion today, which will end at 2 p.m. Eastern, um, we're going to then have a 30 minute sort of talk back uh, uh, discussion for the participants and everyone is welcome 
to join that. Um, it's especially uh, it's especially welcome for those in their 20s and 30s who want to have the opportunity to digest and kind of interpret some of what they hear today. Um, so without any further ado, I want to kick it over to our moderator today, Dr. Ana Lucia Lopez Revodero, uh, who is a Peruvian Chilean American sociologist born in Peru, raised in Spain in the United States. Uh, she is a scholar uh, of migration and Ana Lucia founded Jutina Ico in 2019 in order to offer Latin Jews from around the world a community in which to celebrate and explore Latin Jewish multiculturalism and Jewish peoplehood. She is the recipient of the National Young Woman of Distinction Award, is a former Fulbright and Rotary International Scholar. She sits on the JDC Entwines Council, JPRO and Urban Adama's Board of Directors, and is a member of the Schusterman Foundation's ROI community, uh, Illuminates Collective, and is a Wexner Field Fellow. Without th further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to you and Lucia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I know people are coming from so many, are calling in from so many different places. My name is Ana Lucia, and I am truly delighted to be here to facilitate such an important conversation that really seeks to unpack and understand and, and challenge the existing biases within American Jewish philanthropy. Today, it's a conversation that is that I hope this is the reason why you're all here. It's that we have three incredible organizational leaders who are here to, to discuss um, what our session is all about. It's titled, Making Philanthropy Work for Jews of Color, Sephardim and Mizrahim. So if that's not where you intended to go, I'm still happy you're here. Um, but let's just really get to it. In an ideal world, philanthropy should be a unifying force. It should offer support and opportunity to all, regardless of race, background, ethnicity, or social identity. However, the reality is that racial bias and often unconscious bias that is so, so deeply entrenched in everything that we do has influenced the landscape of American Jewish philanthropy and philanthropy as a whole, really mirroring broader social patterns of exclusion. And as we know, philanthropy is possible because of capitalism. It's possible because of power. It's possible because of money. And in all of that, it is also wanting to remedy a lot of things that have been, have rendered the world inequitable. And so it's this funny, complex reality that we always are navigating. And so at this moment in time, as we navigate this, it's important to acknowledge that our Jewish communal funding structure, um, our mechanisms have on numerous occasions demonstrated an exclusionary trend. These mechanisms have often met the needs of some, well, often inadvertently excluding others, many people in this room, specifically Jews of color, Sephardim, and Mizrahim. So today, uh, we have the privilege of understanding a little bit more as to what it is that people have experienced who are in the field and who are on a daily basis uh, wanting to ensure that the program and the program offering that they're giving to our community is well-funded and supported. And we have the privilege to hear from distinguished leaders that I will introduce in just one second. Each one of these leaders represents organizations that serve a diverse set of community members within the United States, as well as Israel and Palestine. And they will share their experiences, their challenges and insights regarding the American Jewish philanthropic system. Um, our, our folks, our panelists will also present their views on what needs to change and why it's imperative that we do better, that we all do better. And even though you might not be a panelist today, you are someone walking away by hearing uh, these testimonials and hearing these experiences. And so we really count on you to being part of our movement and helping mobilize the change that's needed. So really it's our hope that the session not only informs you, but also galvanizes you and all of us towards creating a more inclusive, equitable and philanthropic system that truly represents and serves the diverse fabric of the Jewish community. So with that, this is an invitation to open up your minds, open up your heart uh, as we embark on this journey of growth together. So thank you all for being here. So before we move into our set of questions, I have I want to introduce our three speakers. The first person that we have is Kohenet Shoshana Brown. Uh, Kohenet Shoshana Brown, who is also a, a licensed uh, master uh, social worker, is a healer, educator, and organizer. They organize as an abolitionist and is a co-founder of the Black Jewish Liberation Collective and a member of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, where they host Beyond the Pale, a radio show on WBAY. 
BAI 99.5 FM. Wow, I've never read, I haven't read a name of a radio station in a long time. As an educator, Shoshana works as the U.S. Director of Pedagogy and Training for the Diaspora Alliance and has a long history of working as a restorative justice practitioner. NYC high school social worker, adjunct professor at C, uh, uh, CUNY Hunters College, Silberman School of Social Work, Syringe Exchange Program Director, and Forensic Social Worker. She's a Black, mixed-race, Jewish femme who generates liberation and full selfhood in the essence of love. We are so thankful to have you here, Kohana Shoshana. Our next speaker, our next guest is, is Tom Mehager. Tom is the Executive Director of Amram Association, the Yemenite, Mizrahi, and Balkan Children Affair. He is a regular, he is a regular contributor to Haaretz, 972 Magazine and Middle East Eye, as well as a former fellow at Harvard Divinity School, Harvard Divinity School's Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative. Tom also served as the program manager for globalization and sovereignty cluster at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. And prior to that, directed the communications department at Alala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. Thank you, Tom, for being here. And then last but not least, our third guest is Jenny Rudolph. Jenny is a Los Angeles-based musician and multimedia editor with a passion for authentic and underrepresented storytelling. She was raised on the periphery of multiple communities as a mixed race, secular Asian American Jew with Cantonese and Russian Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. She serves as co-executive director of Lunar Collective, cultivating connection, belonging, and visibility for Asian American Jews. Jenny is a Berkeley College of Music graduate, a Pat Pattinson songwriting award scholar, Songs for Change honoree and Johnny Mercer Songwriters Project Fellow. So welcome Jenny as well. It's so good to be here with all three of you. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just go dive into the questions because I want us to ensure that we get to hear from all folks and that we can transition to, to questions from, from, the, from, uh, from everyone that's in attendance when we're able to. This first question is specific. Um, we're gonna go, we're gonna have Shoshana answer first. And the question is, what specific challenges have you encountered in fundraising for your organization and how have you navigated them? How do you think serving Jews of color, Sephardi Mizrahi audiences add to those challenges in fundraising? Thank you so much. First of all, hello everyone. I see such wonderful people here, um, people that I have worked closely with um, and others who I hope to work closely with in the future, so hello. Um, I am really glad to be talking about this conversation because uh, I think that I, I have had a unique and different approach to fundraising um, at as the Black Jewish Liberation Collective um, from the very beginning. It was, we did not start actively fundraising until about our uh, sixth or yeah, about our sixth year in existence. Um, we were a completely volunteer led organization. And I think in some ways that that's important to highlight because uh, the, work of organizing Jews of color is very different from most other organizing spaces that I've been part of. And I've been part of issue-based social justice organizing. I've been part of um, union and labor organizing. And so I've had a broad uh, experience of different types of um, nonprofits and organizing spaces. And I'll say that the work of organizing Jews of color has been uh, particularly different in the sense that it is slower and um, takes more, uh, more of a, um, in an intention to build a specific type of space where Jews of color can feel safe to come together. Um, and that's not inherent um, in any given space just because you name it Jews of color. There are so many things that come up against us when we step into a space and those experiences of trauma can definitely show up and reiterate themselves even in spaces that we want to create for ourselves. So there's layers upon 
some layers of hurdles and challenges that we have to overcome. And so what that means is that our work in building organizations actually moves slower than a lot of uh, philanthropists and um, fund funders expect based on the field of social justice or the field of community organizing. Um, and I think that has been definitely a big challenge to navigate because people are like, oh, but I'm, you know, applying for new funding, but they're like, oh, but you're not a new organization. <laughs> like we, we're not a startup, so we can't give you the startup organization money. <laughs> and that feels like a, a very big challenge because even though we are, we have been building for a long time, we are still just starting to um, be in a place where we're ready to accept help um, and accept the um, financial support that is needed to further our goals. Um, and I think uh, another big challenge uh, that has happened for us is just sort of navigating around the Israel-Palestine conversation um, and looking for um, funders uh, has that has come up often um, as a blatant question, like what, what is your organization's stance on Israel-Palestine, et cetera? Um, and that has been a huge barrier because we see ourselves as being like very rooted and grounded in our membership. We are a collective, it's in our name. Um, and so for me, I don't want to limit anything that we do because of some funding that we get. Um, I want our membership to be able to dictate what is needed in the um, political orientations that we take. Um, and the way that I have continued to navigate that is just be very honest with our funders and letting them know what are the things that we're doing, how are we moving, and also being really intentional as we do our work, um, as we do our political work, being really intentional and thoughtful about bringing our whole community along for the ride um, and making sure that everyone in the collective is on board for the politics. So um, I think that that is a huge thing that has sometimes prevented us from um, receiving funding um, in some spaces. And we've been okay with that thus far because at the end of the day, we want to remain earnest and in integrity with who we are with being a collective and being um, a, a voice of the Black Jewish community. Thank you, Shoshana. I'm going to pass that over to Tong for the same question. And for those wondering, what was that question again? I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. So, you know, go for it, Tong. Okay. Hello. Good evening, every, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, interesting and important uh, panel. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, well, the challenges are huge. Um, basically, I think as a Mizrahi Jews uh, in Israel, Palestine, our community and our organization are in Israel, Palestine. Um, from the point of view of uh, the different funds, mainly in the US, the main issue in Israel-Palestine is the Israeli occupation in 67. Um, and maybe the second issue is uh, the Jewish majority inside 48 and uh, the relationships with the Palestinian minority. So I think the main challenge is that the perspective of, I would say, colorblind about the Jewish collective in Israel-Palestine. There's a Jewish collective. Uh, and the main issue is how the Jewish collective uh, will uh, reconciliate with end the occupation of 67, reconciliate with the Palestinian people, back to 67, back to uh, Israel as a liberal democratic state. So the perspective of colorblind is a challenge for us, of course, because the Jewish collective here is 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 part is we all part of uh, migrant groups different migrant groups and uh, to explain that and to say how it's important and crucial for a, a democracy for a just society and also the way it intersects 
like different intersection with the Palestinian uh, Jewish conflict, etc. It's a challenge. It's a huge uh, challenge. And uh, like our organization are dealing with uh, the Yemenite uh, Mizrahi and Balkan children affair. In short, during the 50s, when uh, Mizrahi Jews, when different communities from Muslim and Arab states, Jewish communities from Muslim and Arab states uh, migrant to Israel, uh, in thousands of cases, children were taken from families and they never saw them by, uh, since. Like children, ta children were taken and the next thing that the, the parents heard is the child has died, go home. Nobody, no grave, no certificate, no documents, nothing. This is the pattern of thousands of cases. And up until now, um, thousands of families still have doubts about the faith of the children. Just I'm saying it in short in order to explain how, how the issue is very specifically. It's an issue for us as a constitution, as a institutional racism. And that the challenge is to explain that those issues are totally part of a just society, of a civil society. It must be part of the agenda. Uh, not as a competition, of course, with other agendas, but as a whole. Um, in short, I think that the way we can help these challenges are, I, I think that uh, first to have collaborate collaborators um, such as today, let's say, the way we talk about it um, um, in different positions, it's very important in the board of, let's say, in the board of NAF. So we have a Mizrahi representation uh, in terms of, let's say, diversity. So we have someone to, he is our ambassador, let's say. We can ask him to explain how important is that, etc. Um, it's a huge challenge. Um, okay, I, later we'll talk about more maybe how we uh, how we can handle different challenges. But I think in a way that let's say if we take our organization as an example, uh, we also adjust uh, to work together with other organizations, with coalitions, etc. So we don't have a lot of resources, but the way we cooperate with uh, let's say physicians for human rights. Who deals, which is much bigger organization, but now it became a, an organization that work with, work with us totally together. It's a way, it's a way for us to deal with different challenges. Um, so this is basically the way we are like trying to maneuver things. Thank you so much, Tom. Jenny, same question. Thank you. So happy to be here and be having this conversation. Um, when it comes to challenges, um, an important piece of context here is that the Lunar Collective, the only organization by and for Asian American Jews, we are like 80% young adults. We skew very young, mostly Gen Z, younger millennials. So our community donates what they can, but it's a lot of small donations. And as a result, we rely on a lot of grant funding for the majority of our revenue. And of course, this can create a power dynamic with mostly white led institutions. So that's definitely something that we navigate. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is more of the kind of internal struggle of dealing with scarcity mindset and having grown up, speaking for myself, at least I grew up in a family that was raised to be very frugal and transitioning from a very frugal upbringing to running a nonprofit and being granted money that you are to use for a certain purpose and then actually needing to spend that money. I think there's a lot of growing pains of learning like it's okay to actually spend the money that I'm allotting for this thing and it's not going to run out. I don't need to panic. I'm I'm doing the math and I'm I'm budgeting for things and I can see that it'll be fine. Um, but that's definitely a the whole cycle of fundraising and then spending the money and then bringing in more money has definitely been something to get used to coming from my sort of upbringing and also asking for money is hard when it comes to fundraising and asking our community for money even as we know we're giving them we're filling a need we're giving them a reason to donate but i think so many of us grew up having 
being taught that you don't ask for money, you don't ask for help, you don't make yourself an inconvenience for others. Um, I think that can be a very cultural thing as well. And so often it can feel embarrassing, awkward, or even like shameful to go through the song and dance of asking for money, whether that's um, like small dollar like crowdfunding or in meetings with grant funders. Um, so things like that are definitely, have definitely been new territory and um, come with all these sorts of barriers that for me feels like a very cultural thing. Thank you, Jenny. I couldn't agree more. And I think many people are nodding their heads to all of the things that you all said, because when we're talking about funding, we're not really just talking about money, right? We're not just talking about a financial transaction, but really we're talking about uh, sustaining a lifeline that is powering organizations, that drives our missions, that catalyzes change, uh, specifically for the communities that we're serving. And when it comes for us that are that are working tirelessly to uplift Jews of color, Mizrahim, Sephardim communities, uh, funding isn't just a commodity for us. It's what's going to allow us to keep moving this work forward. So I think when it comes to being a properly funded organization, um, we need to be thinking about not only how are we providing, are we able to have those resources to provide the services and programs that resonate with our community and the narratives that are that, that we know exist that have kind of been left to the periphery to fend for themselves, but it's also about creating opportunities for to employ staff members who mirror those lived experiences in a way that feels equitable, in a way that feels sustainable, where people are going to feel happy to go to work, where they're going to feel valued to go to work, um, and, and to ensure that we're doing so in a way that's breaking cycles, not continuing cycles of oppression within systems, just because we feel that there is less money. So I think there's this whole, when we're thinking about funding, it's really about breaking systems, breaking cycles, and remembering that we're not just service providers, uh, that we're truly providing sanctuary and sacred space for so many people, and that your work, um, your avodah, which is honorable, like the word in Hebrew avodah is so rooted in kavod and honor, that it's honorable and that it's worth preserving that it's worth um, funding and that we need you to keep moving that work forward. So really at the heart of this conversation, it's so important that when we're thinking about funding, we're, we're thinking about the myriad of pieces that relate to it, specifically when it comes to dismantling the various barriers that exist to so many folks who are benefiting from our, our the structures that we're creating and also for ourselves. So just wanted to bring that piece in because I know for folks it's like we're talking about funding and it's and it's such a big picture here. So thank you. Um, to our next question, and it's of course we're we're talking about your own experience. So in your experience as a professional, as a community member leading a nonprofit, curious to know a little bit more about the barriers or biases that you've observed in the fundraising landscape. So maybe you want to talk about the experiences that you've had with um, with larger funders and, and how you've worked to overcome those particular barriers or biases. Uh, and for this one, I'm going to go ahead and start with Jenny. Oh, I have a bunch. Um, I think one one bias that our team has encountered a lot is people viewing us as young and doubting our experience and our leadership skills as a result. I mean, we are young. I'm 25. Um, I have many years ahead of me and I, I don't discount that I am young, but at the same time, I think other people sometimes dismiss the value that does come with being a Gen Z leader. For one, we are representative of our demographics, so we speak our language, we know how to relate and connect with our community. Um, and I think there's also a certain kind of agility and uh, freshness that comes with being a young leader as well, that I personally find really empowering. Um, but I find, and this is a multitude of things, it's being young, it's being a woman, it's um, being Asian American, all of those kind of all at once affect my experience as a leader. I find that there are so many barriers. I find that people devalue our time sometimes. I've had meetings where somebody was like over 20 minutes late without a warning that they were running late and we were just sitting there in the Zoom waiting. Um, I've had times where people ask us for all these favors and 
kind of assume that we're willing to give our time for unpaid things, different meetings and and focus groups and things where other organizations have offered honorariums and such, but people kind of make the assumption that they're entitled to our time um, and being surprised when we <laughs> try to advocate for ourselves and, and see, see what's possible. Um, also, it, it's very difficult sometimes when grant money comes slow, when the actual payout is towards the end of the cycle or even after the cycle, and then we are expected to front program costs ourselves and then reimburse ourselves later, but we need to pay ourselves. That kind of like cash flow issue, I think, is a thing that is not talked about enough because I think it comes from a place of privilege a bit where people are not used to having that issue so they don't even think about the fact that oh we have a team of people to pay we need to put on this program that you are paying us to do but you're putting us in a position where we need to front those costs and that will create cash flow issues for ourselves so it's things like that and then and then it's tricky to like bring that up and and feel like we're not overstepping those kinds of dynamics are tricky um i think when it comes to like asserting our worth in the community and like pitching ourselves for funding. Um, one tricky thing is that, well, one, people really don't realize how many Asian Jews there are. They think there are like three of us. And then we show them the numbers. We show that there are thousands of us. We show how many people are engaging with us and people are shocked. But even once they see the numbers, it's often a lot of pressure on us to prove why that matters. Um, Often we hear like, oh, that's so interesting. That's so fascinating. Oh, tell me your story. Like they they want to know our story because they find it interesting, but not always recognizing us as being a crucial part of this community and also a growing part of this community and, and seeing the, the future of the Jewish community as being increasingly multiracial, increasingly diverse, um, making assumptions about who our community is. Um, there's this misconception, I think, that Asian Jews are wealthy. I think that's kind of a compounding model minority myth, um, but that's definitely not generally true. Our community is totally not a monolith. monolith. Um, and also many of us didn't grow up with access to Jewish institutions, whether that's you know synagogues, day schools, Hillel, like speaking for myself, I went, I went to a Jewish preschool, but after my Jewish preschool closed, I didn't really have access to any Jewish community. I had a few Jewish friends, but I didn't, I didn't go to any institutions. And it wasn't until after college when I founded Lunar, co-founded Lunar, and that was kind of my, my entrance into the Jewish world, a path that I was co-creating myself. So I think there can often be assumptions about the ways in which somebody can belong in the Jewish community and find their way here and how much you need to know and what kind of upbringing you need to have to really fit here that I want to absolutely dispute debunk. Um, also, I'm very frustrated with the idea that all Jews of color are fighting for the same pot of money and that there can't be room for all of us. I think when it comes to like DEI money, <laughs> institutions i think have this view of like okay i'm putting aside this amount of money for dei stuff so all jewish diversity fits into this one pot oh i already supported this other joc org or this one org that had like a one jew of color or did one jew of color program so i already spent that money i don't need to invest more in jews of color until next cycle i think they they think it's very limited in that way and that ties back to the scarcity mindset thing um, and then the other thing I wanted to share is that part of this dynamic also is organizations who want the diversity points of supporting us, want to seem like they're supporting us um, without actually supporting us. Um, there have been a few incidents, I, I won't name any names, but after every time there's some anti-Asian tragedy, everybody's really quick to post about us and put out some kind of statement to show that they support Asian Jews and, you know, take something from our website and 
and put it on social media without consulting us or without even like properly checking in with us, asking what our needs are, asking how they can genuinely help. It's all for their image. And I find that really frustrating. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, um, I think one so many, so many incredible points and that piece around the monolith um, is something that I, you know, if we're walking away with a big learning, that's one that we should all continue to be rem to, to ruminate on um, as we move forward. I'm going to pass it over to Shoshana with that same question. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, I want to double down on one thing that you said here, which is the piece um, just about like that, uh, like we're all fighting for the same pie, like that scarcity mindset of like, there's only but so much to go around. Um, and I definitely like have experienced that. And in some ways is the most, uh, I've experienced that in many ways where there's a uh, very that's word yeah uh to like color and instead of like being in collaboration and being in conversation with each other um and even even for funders bringing us into conversation with each other rather like an rfp goes out and we're meant to compete against each other um rather than sort of working together to figure to partner and figure out like what actually is the need in our community and how can this money be best used to to, um, for the aims of all of our work, which I think is similar um, in terms of supporting our communities, um, uplifting Jewish diversity, fighting racism, um, fighting anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, and so that, that has been an interesting thing. And one way that I have seen that play out specifically is not only with regard to like fighting internally, but also um, being blamed denied funding for anti-racism work. Um, I submitted a proposal a few years, uh, not even a few years, but um, some time back to a larger or a larger funder who put out um, an RFP for anti-racism work. And I just thought like, Hello, Black Jewish Liberation Collective. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say like, anti-racism work uh, uh, within the Jewish community. And literally this organization was like, oh no, like we don't want to give Jews of color the money. We want to give white Jews money to do anti-racism work. And it just threw me for such a loop. Like that is the orientation that even inside of anti-racism funding, white supremacy is still winning out. Like we are still being denied access to funding around the very issues that are affecting our lives. And so that just feels so, I, I am so like, uh, I get very activated around that because it just, sh that is a great example that shows you the layers that we have to like hurdle over and jump over to get to funding that actually impacts our communities and actually has like, actually can move the conversation in a different way. Um, and I wanna also just come back to the other piece that I mentioned earlier, which is Israel-Palestine, like both on an organizational level, but I think this question is asking about um, my experience as a community member leading the nonprofit. And I think when I personally sit in those conversations, um, it's not only uh, for me an issue of like, working through and like supporting and being clear about where my members sit and so and representing um, my members inside of the conversation of Israel Palestine and where our politics fall there but it's also very triggering in the sense that Israel Palestine has often been used particularly towards Black Jews as a brown paper bag test, as a way um, to, as a, as a racism, like, 
thermostat as a way to say like, well, how, how Jewish are you really? And like, who is in this Black Jewish liberation collective? Like, who do you consider a Black Jew? And it, I think the question of Israel-Palestine is often coded um, as a, in, in terms of racism as a way to characterize um, what our membership is made of and who who we are and um, verifying or validating our Jewish identity or not. Um, and the other thing that I want to um, mention here is that I think I often feel a, a, a very important piece, which is um, this idea I think, can folks hear Shoshana? Okay, well, that idea is, is a, I'm sure, a brilliant idea. Let's see. Um, I'm gonna get back to that idea just for, because she's maybe needing to reconnect and I'm gonna pass that. Sorry, Shoshana, thank you so much. So I'm gonna pass it over to Tom to answer that question, same question. Okay, and I might stop and we can, uh... Is Shoshana is back? Ah, no, okay. Um, well, barriers. First, as uh, Jenny said before, uh, I'm afraid that it's uh, a question of entitlement. Sometimes we are not demanding enough. Maybe we don't feel uh, comfortable enough uh, to say our mission, our cause is very, very important. Give us money. Maybe uh, we are not, um, I don't know, demanding enough. Shoshana is back. Do you want us to? Yeah. So maybe we can. I think you should just finish, Tom, and then we'll come back. We'll we'll end it with that with Shoshana's big idea. Yeah. Okay. So Shoshana, we'll wait to big idea. Um, um, second, I have to say that if the Mizrahi struggle as a whole, the Mizrahi struggle is the Israeli discourse challenging certain perspective about justice, which is a huge barrier because um, according to the Israeli left, most of it, and of course also the fundraiser. And the funds, in many cases, Israel was built as a social democratic state, a proper social democratic state, and then came 67, the occupation, and ruined it all. While for us, the Mizrahi Jews, the defining moments in history of institutional racism, of crimes against our community, was during the 50s. So if we talk about it, if we ask money in order to uh, in order to promote this agenda, we actually challenging the whole narrative of the Israeli left, and uh, and it's it's a whole thing in the past uh, twenty years. I think there has been interesting shift or at least interesting discussions about what is the meaning of talking justice in Israel Palestine about Zionism etc. And in that sense, Mizrahi Jews, our community, our organization definitely challenging uh, certain uh, perspectives. Um, I think that our, our, our cooperation with the NIF is kind of a good example um, because uh, like your question was, how can we uh, get over those uh, barriers? Um, and I think that when it comes that, that like, like when the relationship with the funds is not only about money. It's about the whole politics of the organization. It's actually being a partners. So in that sense, I feel that the younger generation, both in Israel, Palestine and in the US, understand the complicity of 48, 67, think about colonial elements in Zionism, etc in a way that we can talk differently about justice. And in, the, in that sense, NIF, I'm not saying that NIF became non-Zionist at, at, at all, but maybe more open to different elements, to different narratives as in comparison of, I don't know, 25 years ago. And I feel that like the way I talk with the NIF in many cases, it's not only about money. The money is, is following the conversation and the and the understanding, the sheer understanding of what's important now. 
before and then let's talk about money but let's first understand together what's important to our community from our perspective um so just for an example when they like i was abroad like i was in new york and boston like i don't know four months ago and and i we talked together with the AIF, with me talking about the Zahi perspective in the US. It wasn't about fundraising. It was about the conversation itself. The fundraising is part of the partnership. So uh, yeah, I hope it works. I think it, it works, but uh, we have a lot of challenges in, uh, in, uh, oh, most of the time. OK, back to Shoshana's idea. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yes, Shoshana, back to you for that. Close us off with this question. Please share your idea. Um, can you hear? I hope I'm I'm being heard here, uh, and this is transmitting. I'm sorry for the weak Wi-Fi where I am. Um, I great. Um, I am really just wanted to say that I think the the last thing that's really important is to note that um, despite a lot of efforts that I have seen um, newer funders, younger funders, newer foundations make, um, I still uh, have experienced the funding world and foundation world as very white supremacist in the sense that it is about like who you know and how you know them and um, having relationships. Um, and so it's always about like, how do you, um, you know, do you have a connection? connection to somebody? Do you know this person? Do you know that person? And um, one of the things that has been hugely helpful is that thankfully a lot of our funders recognize that and have done their best and their work to push past that and introduce us to other funders and let us know about different opportunities. Um, but I think that that still is something that is pervasive throughout the um, foundation world. And I think that, that that's something I would like to see changed in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just to be respectful of time, I think um, we are gonna go, we're gonna transition to the, the Q&A part segment um, of this time together that we have this morning. Uh, so we've got a question from, from Cody Edgerly, which I really appreciate. And the question is, um, and I'm, I think we can put it out to, to the panelists here, um, but maybe it, it applies more to folks who are in the United States, given that conversations around DEI have been uh, much more present, specifically when it comes to DEI funding. And so the question is, what have you seen as the limitations of using DEI funding as a framework for supporting JOCSM work. And one of the ways I interpret that question is oftentimes a lot of foundations will have like buckets of funding for DI, like some, some of that just came up right now. And, and JOCSM uh, serving organizations, JOCSM led organizations oftentimes fall within that funding bucket, that kind of portfolio. And so where, what are the limitations you all experience in that frame? Um, as I mentioned, I, all of you, any of you can answer it, but I think just because of that specific language, it might be more relatable to US-based organizations. I feel very passionate about this question. Um, limitations of using DEI funding as a framework for supporting our work. It doesn't account for the joy <laughs> that comes with being an Asian Jew. I, you know, DEI funding, it's a bucket of funding. Often that's the closest bucket that we can fit ourselves into, but it it really frames it as how Jews of color can fit into the existing predominantly white framing and how we can fit ourselves in um, when really, you know, it should be more about how the community can work for all of us. Um, but it also is so centered on our pain. <laughs> it's about educating other people on how to not other us. And sometimes, you know, if, if we are going to be in the role of educating people, pay us <laughs> properly. But often we're not supposed to be in that role. Often we need spaces to just exist and be joyful together, be in community and thrive and celebrate who we are. And often DEI isn't really the 
spirit of what we're doing. So that's a, definitely a frustration I feel where, you know, education is, is part of what we do, but it's not all of what we do. And it's not our, like the sole value that we hold. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Shoshana, Tom, did you want to add anything else to that? No, absolutely. And I also, I'll also add one other thing about DEI work is that I think it also devalues a lot of the work that JOCSM organizations are doing and only sees them as being this um, external or like branch to the rest of Jewish life versus actually in, being integrated to different levels of Jewish life, whether it's community building, whether it's early childhood, whether it's Jewish education, like JOC assembly led organizations are, off, are, are doing that work. And by exclusively funding them through a DEI funding lens, then you're just seeing them as being this branch to this accessory to what is at the central core of Jewish life. Um, not to mention that oftentimes people see it as like a finite source of, of, of funding. And, and that's not think where any of our organizations belong, uh, wish to belong or deserve to belong. So that's another piece, just adding a two cents. Um, we have one final question and this is really open to all of you. Um, what successes have you and your organizations had in recent years that you're most proud of? Like, let's talk about that joy and, and how have those successes, um, how were those successes possible? Maybe despite all the challenges you all just mentioned. I'm so happy to start on this question. <laughs> um, I feel really excited about the work that Black Jewish Liberation is doing right now. Um, we are in the midst of uh, thinking through and preparing for um, what could be a long-term um, external political strategy uh, and um, just rooting down and building some long-term systems sustainable systems within our organizational framework that can carry us forward for the next, I'm thinking for the next seven years, right? Like the next Shemitah. Like I am very, very, very excited about that kind of work and building new leadership. So we are, we have been in over the last two years, like really being thoughtful about how we prepare for and bring in um, new leadership and build new leadership, as well as like create more coalition work and more collaboration with other folks. Um, and just to see the proliferation um, and be a, on this exact panel here, just to me feels like Black Jewish Liberation Collective has been part of a success that um, is larger than Black Jewish Liberation Collective, but is all of ours to claim in the sense that um, like Jews of color have been fighting for so long to stake out space and claim space and be more visible. And I think over the last maybe five years, the like bubbling up to the surface and the expansion of so many amazing organizations like the ones here on this panel and others has just been um, like just such a like amazing amazing feat that we are gaining more voice um, and having more opportunities to work together and um, really just think about how we are uh, presenting a new face to the, of the Jewish community in the United States and beyond. Thank you so much. I think, you know, we've got time for one more question. Actually, I want to bring you into this convo, Tom, because I think you bring in this very unique perspective, specifically given that oftentimes your work, you're having to balance a lot of the Israel-Palestine politics that are taking place. And obviously the government affects your funding. And so I'm just curious what your experience has been like in wanting to focus on something that some people might see as deterrent to a unified state, a unified Jewish people, and kind of how you navigate uh, justice in the name and in place of so much uh, pushback to be on a united front. Well, I need you to explain me again the question. I think I understood, but maybe try to put it another way so I can understand. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm just curious to know a little bit more about how you balance Israel Palestine politics when fundraising for your organization and knowing ah, that okay. things can shift based on the government in place. 
Okay, and I think that in a way it's important to understand that um, it's it's not it's not a competition, of course, but even more, like let's talk about the Mizrahi Jews to understand that the experience of the Mizrahi Jews in many ways are based on our Arabness, the fact that we are Jews, Arabs, and like let's say a few generations ago, and the social and, and the, the institutional racism is following that. And in that sense, to understand, let's say, uh, the fact that uh, Israel in many in many cases talk about itself as villa in the jungle, like to, the, the, like Israel is uh, again its own re repeat. The, the, its own image of Israel as a, as a as a white place, while the savages are around it. It's important to understand also that we are coming from the so-called jungle. So not only it's not a competition. We must understand that in the history of Israel, Zionism, Zionism etc., uh, things are. In, in many ways, there are intersections between uh, the things, and if we want, if we want to solve this problem, we have to take this into consideration the other problem, both sides. I mean, also as a Mizrahi Jews, we can't talk about justice without talking about uh, the occupation and the practices of um, of land annexation, of deportation, etc., against uh, the Palestinian people. Um, so maybe it takes me back to the the point before, like like fundraising is for me, and maybe it's, I'm a bit naive. I don't know. I'm not, it's not my profession. <laughs> like I'm just being honest about it. Fundraising is first of all about being honest about our agenda, and to see if if we can meet each other in our agenda, and 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 once once I can explain what it's all about and how we see what our perspective why it's important then we can talk about resources i hope i answered <laughs> yeah no thank, thank you, you so much thank you so much tom thank you jenny thank you shoshana uh, i'm going to go ahead and pass it over to zach it's been such a pleasure to be able to be facilitating this conversation really looking forward to continued partnership and friendship with all of you